Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today in our first 2022 Politics, Power and Persuasion event. This is an event series uh, run by students from the MA program from Political Strategy and Communication from the Brussels Schools of International uh, Studies from the University of Kent. Today we have a very special guest. We will be addressing the topic is free media under threat in Europe. Uh, we are very pleased to introduce you to one of the most eminent figures of the journalist profession, Alison Smell. Ms. Smell was the first woman to hold the position of executive editor at the International Herald Tribune in Paris. She served as chief correspondent for the New York Times for Germany and Central and Eastern Europe and deputy foreign editor also for the New York Times. She was then appointed Under Secretary General for Global Communications at the United Nations Department of Public Information, just to name a few of her accomplishments. But who better to talk about her trajectory than Ms. Mill herself? Please give her a warm round of applause. So thank you very much for this. Um, what better to talk about than myself. Um, it's not something I do very often, but I always enjoy to meet especially younger people. And I think that you could safely say was one of the elements of curiosity that has driven my journalistic quest for a long time. So it forced me to think about, well, how did I come upon the idea of becoming a journalist and why was that important and why was it important to express oneself freely. And for my part, this sort of dates back to the era of 1968 when I actually made my first trip abroad ever. It was a trip without my parents to a French pen friend as we then had relations with our peers there was no internet, and 1968 was the year of French Revolution, was the year of the Czechoslovak Prague Spring, and the Soviet bloc invasion that quashed that. That made a very strong impression on me for some unknown reason. Another very strong impression came when I was studying in Berlin, for, in Munich for a year, and I made a trip to Berlin. At that time, the West Berlin authorities were interested in anybody who was st studying German sort of getting their backing for the idea of this continuing island of Western way of life surrounded entirely by communist East Germany. And one of the most striking images was just literally the first time I saw the Berlin Wall was here was this wall in the middle of a street, very obviously cutting what was meant to be one street into two halves. And that's kind of how I feel about when we ask ourselves the question, do we have free media? Is there freedom of expression? You would actually don't need people to tell you when there's no freedom of expression. It's obvious. It's as obvious as the wall in that Berlin street was. And as obvious as when the wall came down in 1989 and by great good fortune, I had arrived in Berlin the day before and was there to witness this incredible development of the Berlin Wall just falling due to a mistake by East European, East German bureaucrats, basically. So that was a moment in my career that night in November 1989, which was definitely the best party that I have ever attended because it was purely powered by the joy of unexpected liberation. And again, nobody needs to tell you what that's about. When you see it, you know what it is. Similarly, if we see what we consider impediments to free speech in action today or freedom of movement, which is a, you know, a question mark in this time of COVID and governments trying to 
fulfill their duty to ensure public health and safety and not perhaps violate freedom of movement. And it's, it's a difficult balance, but we all recognize when these questions arise, we don't actually need someone to tell us when there's a lack of freedom, we feel it. The question is only how, what do you do in acting on it? And I was very fortunate <clears throat> in my career to have moments where you clearly confront what the issue is. What is freedom? Who are the people who should be able to express themselves? The idea that a man like Václav Havel, who became something of a friend of mine during my years of covering Eastern Europe, this is a man who thought very deeply about his country. You might not always agree with him, but it was always very intelligently expressed, rooted in the history and the literature and the traditional forms of expression in the Czech and Slovak lands. You didn't need <coughs> communists to tell you that this was not something that was the, identified with the communist state. So um, I thought I would sort of take a quick tour through my career, which really began after I had graduated from university in England. I studied German and politics at the University of Bristol. And during the year that I spent abroad in Munich, I'd met a lot of Americans who were studying in Europe and I'd always been fascinated by the United States, but didn't want to do just the thing of getting on a Greyhound bus and crossing America and saying, I've been across America. So I was applying for all sorts of possibilities to study in the United States. And to cut a long story short, ended up being offered a full maintenance grant and a full tuition scholarship by Stanford University to enter its program for 12 master's students of journalism. And I was incredibly lucky that this happened because there were two women on the faculty uh, of the journalism department at that time. And the faculty had been just about to award the tuition grant and maintenance grant to a fellow from Oxford. When these two women on the faculty argued that it should go to the young woman from Bristol. And so this was the first time I had benefited from and have always remained very conscious of a conscious attempt to give something to even up the playing, level the playing table, if it, as it were. So I was able to enter Stanford and I will always remain grateful to the university and to the bigger United States outside the university for opening up one of the institutions to a woman from England who had no connections in the United States at all. And no matter what happens in America, I can never forget that. And it was then I graduated and I was able to get an internship with UPI in Bonn in late 1978. And it was there that I cut my journalistic teeth, as it were. And after four months was employed on the desk in London, where copy was taken from Asia, Latin America, and Africa, and Middle East, and channeled to different clients of the UPI wire. Uh, one of the other people who was doing this in the sort of somewhat grubby Fleet Street office was Tom Friedman, who, as we all know, went on to a very illustrious career at the New York Times. So I was there with a broad variety of UK and US journalists. And I was then chosen to go back to Bonn, where I had been an intern. And at age 24, I was made the bureau chief for UPI in Bonn, which gave, meant I was circulating with really top journalists at a very young age and able to take their experience and learn from them 
as I was assigned to stories like the IRA hunger strikes in Northern Ireland in 1981. And somewhat more incongruously, the royal wedding of Diana and Charles. I wrote the story about the dress. Um, then I was trans I transferred from UPI to AP and I was able to go to Moscow for four years, which is where I met and married my husband, who's a Russian pianist and composer, Sergei Dreznin. Um, but I also was part of the political changes. When I arrived in Moscow, Leonid Brezhnev had not long died. The feared KGB chief Yuri Andropov had taken over as the leader, but he obviously fell ill very swiftly and died. Konstantin Chernenko succeeded him. He died within the next 14 months. And Gorbachev came to power. And I was really part of the very fortunate phalanx of journalists who got assigned to Moscow at a time when it had appeared to become so boring under the years of Brezhnev and stagnation. So that leading journalists who had traditionally been sent to Moscow because it was the superpower rival of, of the United States had all stopped wanting a posting because it was so boring. And younger journalists like me and really a whole phalanx of people arrived and we were the ones who got the story, as it were, because what Gorbachev set in motion led eventually to that wonderful night in Berlin where the Berlin Wall fell. And this was very much the result of small developments that by themselves didn't signify perhaps much. For instance, the Hungarian Communist Party was known as a reformist force. And at the beginning of 1989 had a key meeting in which they decided they would plan for holding the first free elections in Hungary, in socialist ruled Hungary. And at the same time, there was a question of giving asylum to ethnic Hungarians who were escaping from Romania. And these two developments actually came together and it was clear that this would pose a question for what would happen with all the East Germans who came to Lake Balaton in Hungary every year for vacation. As far as we knew, you couldn't just ask to help one sort of person looking for help from Eastern Europe. You couldn't just decide, we're going to help the ethnic Hungarians from Romania, but we're not going to do anything if the East Germans come and ask for freedom to travel into Austria and go to West Germany, which is exactly what happened. The Austrians and the Hungarians also built on their traditional ties and clipped open the Iron Curtain actually in the May of 1989 already, some months before the Berlin Wall fell. So the, I was used to piecing together increment, what were on the face of it incremental developments into a pattern which made it clear that communist power and authority had eroded. And exactly what would bring it to an end, which turned out to be a mistake by the East German Politburo member Gunter Schabowski when he was briefing journalists in November 1989 on that day's doings at the higher echelons of the Communist Party. And he was asked if they were considering changing the travel to to the West, the regulations. And he said, yes. And so then, of course, people asked, well, when is this going to happen? And he shuffled in his papers and he was badly briefed, as we now know, and looked and said, what does it say here? Oh, yes, absolute thought immediately. And I said to my colleague, who I just met that day from the AP German service, <laughs> we've got to get out on the streets and take the, this official report with us and ask people what they think. And we did that and some people were excited and other people were just shrugged their shoulders and other people did just simply didn't believe it. But eventually that night, when we drove back from our reporting foray to ask people's opinion, we went past the Brandenburg Gate. Nothing was happening. It was dead as a doornail. 
Then we went into the East German press center and we were watching te West German television and we could see that people had been dispatched, reporters had been dispatched to the inner border between West and East Germany. And also to, there were crowds gathering at the Bonhomer Straße in Berlin. And eventually West German television said, and we hear that it's also possible to cross at Checkpoint Charlie. And I said, Checkpoint Charlie? If that's true, if that's open, then everything is over. It was really obvious that this would symbolically would say, there's no more Berlin Wall. That that image that I had in my mind from my visit as a student, it would be over. And that's exactly what it was. And it was the result of this, of, series of smaller developments, as it were. We went on to have the wonderful privilege of covering the Czechoslovak Velvet Revolution, as it became known, and the changes in Romania, and also in Bulgaria, which decided to remove Todor Zhivkov from his leadership position but did this on the same, at the same moment as the Berlin Wall was opening. And so people barely registered this in the West. To try and sort of put a smooth presentation on what was a time of turmoil, I prefer not to do it. I prefer to try and relay to you how ad hoc it really was. And this is the way that history happens. It doesn't happen in sort of afterwards. You can put kind of nice smooth headings on things and pretend that there's a logical thread to follow. But in fact, that's not the way human beings run their affairs. They don't sort of have a computer program that says, OK, step A, B and C. And I think that's what we have to remember when we sort of look at what developments are today. And especially in questions of freedom of media and freedom of expression. Call me old fashioned, but I think you just, you look at developments and you make up your own mind. You know what freedom looks like and you know what freedom feels like. And you know when something is not a product of free expression. And I think we can see two very strong forces in the world today. One could broadly be labeled corruption, and its counterpart could broadly be labeled the rule of law. And I think it's no coincidence that you could sort of apply those labels to recent events in Hungary or Poland, and the reaction or lack thereof from the European Union. But everybody knows that these are issues that are driving forces behind certain events. And it's a question of finding how do we express ourselves, what is appropriate, of not imposing some kind of ready solution, but looking for events. And I think we can see very clearly in recent weeks and months that the European Union has woken up to the possibility that you have to do a little bit more than just say we're all now members of the same club. Because whilst we all broadly believe probably in the same things, they mean slightly different things to various leaders and and activists or ordinary people. And I think that it's very worthwhile not just to track things in Brussels and to look at what bureaucracy does, but it's very, very worthwhile to be out in the countries themselves and to see what effect is being a member of this actually very privileged club, the European Union, what effect is that having in particular places? 
And as I say, I've never been one who, who had came with a ready pro program for anything. The best way to track developments is to track them um, and not to come with preconceived ideas of what should be. So I've strayed somewhat from the path of how did my career ev evolve, but I was very fortunate to spend those years in the Soviet Union and then to go to Vienna and cover Eastern Europe, which is often overlooked or people in the region feel as if they're overlooked between the larger forces of Germany and on the Western hand and Russia on the East. But if we look at the time in which I'm actually speaking to you now, here we have a large confrontation on European territory between massed blocks of military power. And I don't think any of us really thought that was going to be something we would see as a result of the liberating forces that were powerful in 1989. And it's worth kind of getting a perspective like that. So I was very fortunate to have witnessed these events in Eastern Europe. At the same time, always running parallel, were the events in Yugoslavia, where it was as obvious as it had been before 1989, it was obvious to me that the communist control over territory in Eastern Europe was eroding. Equally, it was clear that there was a big possibility that there would be a war in Yugoslavia, which there then was. And I think it was, it's very, very sobering to think back on the time of covering the siege of Sarajevo, that this was a siege, like a medieval siege, going on on European territory at the end of the 20th century. And it's always been a mystery how eager Western leaders were to sort of wall it off and just not really to take account of the fact that there was this war raging in the European city. And it always mystified me listening to Chancellor Angela Merkel when she was campaigning uh, in 2013 and again four years later, telling people on the market square of some medium-sized German town, oh, and the older ones amongst you, meine Damen und Herren, will remember what war is like, and it's so wonderful that we have peace in Europe, and to just kind of completely ignore what had happened in Sarajevo. So, I think I was very lucky to be able to take all that, those experiences and bring them to bear when I joined the New York Times in 1998 and went to New York and thought that that was where I would stay, that I would be an editor at the, this wonderful newspaper, which I'd long admired, admired from afar. But what happened was there was a war in Kosovo, in fact, and I was one of the few editors in the newsroom in New York at, at the Times who had been to Kosovo and knew something about, detailed about the background there. And that gave me perhaps a seat at the table, kind of more senior editors usually would have occupied. And I was fortunate to rise in the ranks and to enjoy working with excellent correspondents and under the leadership of Roger Cohen, who, like me, had in 1968 witnessed the events in France and we were of the same generation. He's a brilliant journalist and we 
to both of us having been raised in in the UK were actually in charge of the coverage of the war in Iraq for the foreign desk of the New York Times, which I don't think any other culture other than America would have put such a key task in the hands of people who were not American. That'll be a controversial statement. <laughs> um, but it was it was a wonderful opportunity to sort of benefit from the amazing conviction of US media also, their strong belief in the First Amendment, the strong belief in freedom. But as I say, you don't need to be told when you see it's opposite. And I think everybody knows how to react to violations of freedom. What I learned was that it's very difficult to put freedom of the press into action if you go in there with some kind of program. You just have to act on your instinct. You just have to take events as they come and mold them as, as you can. And I got a great opportunity to do that when I became man first managing editor and then executive editor of the International Herald Tribune. I had really long admired this newspaper, which was 50% owned by the Salzburger family which publishers of the New York Times and 50% by the Graham family, publishers of the Washington Post. And what Arthur Salzberger did was he bought out the Washington Post and was wanted to create a, a more of a global newspaper. And we came to edit that in the spirit of something that I called the conversational menu for the global dinner party. The Global Dinner Party is a gathering that could be happening anywhere in the world on any given night. And at the table, you've got people from a wide, wide variety of experience and profession, aid workers, architects, scientists, politicians. And if you had, my idea was that if you'd been reading the International Herald Tribune on a daily, hopefully, weekly, monthly, yearly basis, you would be able to take part in a conversation at this dinner table. If your neighbor was a fashion designer, you would be able to, if you had been reading the International Herald Tribune, you could contribute in a very learned way to that conversation. And this was a very privileged position to have. I really feel fortunate to have done it. And it prepared the way for opening up the IHT to the general excellence of the New York Times and taking those stories and perhaps arranging them or playing them differently than they were in the New York Times because your readership was a slightly different one. And it paved the way for much more cross-fertilization of the kind that you see every day when you open up nytimes.com. So I think I really have given you a confused enough picture of my path and my motives that it's better if I react to your questions. Um, I just will briefly say that it was equally, of course, a great privilege to round out my career with two years at the U United Nations as Under Secretary General for Global Communication. And I like to think that I opened up this vast department as 800 people um, to a more journalistic approach to their very wonderful work, which is too little heralded, helping people around the world. The United Nations is as everybody knows, 
a large organization and you can't have a large organization without having a certain amount of bureaucracy and it's then easy to point fingers and to criticize lack of action but in fact there is daily hourly action taking place all around the globe under the auspices of the United Nations. And if we didn't have the United Nations, we'd actually just have to get, go out and reinvent it again. So it's very worthwhile trying to make what we have already just simply work better. And I think that's kind of the approach I've always taken to every matter, you know, let's make it work better. So now I'd be very happy to entertain questions Yes, thank you very much for that quick overview of an impressive career. <laughs> and we will now begin with some questions that we prepare with our fellow students. And uh, when we talk about lack of media freedom, we think of regions with weaker democratic institutions. Uh, is there a difference between the European phenomenon and what happens in Asia or Latin America, for example? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I should just emphasize that Latin America, unfortunately, is an area of the world which I visited very little and I'm not so familiar with Asia uh, much more and Europe, definitely. Um, I mean, as I have already said, I think you can, you know what freedom looks like. And especially now where everybody is so much more interconnected thanks to digital technology, we can't pretend not to notice when there's a lack of media freedom. I also think it's very important that the Nobel Committee this year gave the Peace Prize to two journalists, one from Russia and one from the Philippines, but both of them standing as voices in their own societies determined not to be silenced and therefore standing for the profession of journalism as a whole. I think it's extremely important that journalism was emphasized in that way as the practitioners of a craft that is our first rough draft, rough draft of history and which as that sets the sets the tone and the the start of a discussion how do we preserve freedom how do we look at free media and as i have said several times now you you know what it feels like and it's very important for all of you to be able to take the experience that you have, for instance, monitoring events in Brussels and spread it beyond Europe. Thank you very much. Um, accusing the media of taking a political stand it has become a common practice to delegitimize its work. Even uh, when there have been many cases of media outlets identifying with a specific political party, uh, ideology, etc., why are we now seeing an increasing mistrust in traditional news sources and an increasing consumption of alternative media? Increasing consumption of? Alternative media. Well, I mean, I think every... Freedom of expression means it's open to everybody if they can find the audience to express themselves. And obviously one keeps a careful watch on when that becomes threatening in some way, if it's as a result of repression. But at the same time, it's it has long been a tradition in Europe, for instance, for a quality newspaper to have a political stance to support one particular party. But at the same time, the best newspapers or the best media have a way of reporting, as they would say, a matter of factly, 
and then on editorial pages or in clearly marked segments of broadcast programs saying, and here's our point of view. It's very important to, to distinguish between something that is a report on an event. For instance, when the Berlin Wall fell and Checkpoint Charlie opened, I, once I got across to West Berlin and was able to talk to my colleagues on the phone there, we forget that there were no mobile phones at that time. So I finally went into a billiard bar and found a phone and called my colleague and said, guess what I just did? I came through Checkpoint Charlie with the first East German to cross. That was an objective fact. The jubilation that was in my voice was an emotional reaction. And the two things together made the sum of the event. And the hilarious thing, the Germans who were asking the East German guards to open the wall, for, they said, we want to go and drink a beer. We just want to go and drink a beer. We'll be at work tomorrow. Who else on the planet Earth? aside from the Germans, would worry about going to work the next day. <laughs> but that emotion was, was necessary to relay because it obviously governed a certain amount of their reaction. We know now, as we didn't then, but the woman who would become Chancellor, Angela Merkel, on that evening, she always went to the sauna on Thursdays with friends. She, she called her mother beforehand and said she thought things were slipping and maybe her mother should get ready some West German currency because they might be able to be in the West soon for a visit. Then she went to the sauna, then she came out, crowds were on the street, she went to a West Berlin family, drank a beer, went home and was at work at eight o'clock the next morning. Um, do you think there is, there is a trend of gap reduction between Eastern and Western European media freedom? I'm sorry, a trend of what? A trend of gap reduction between the Eastern and Western Euro European media freedom? Um, meaning that there's more f there's more freedom in the West, or yeah. Well, I think you know it's obviously. In Eastern Europe, there was a very strong construction of media delivering the, the message of the Communist Party. When things all changed and communist control was over, people suddenly had to make budgets, they had to get advertising, they had to have a set of skills that they hadn't had before. And it may just be that there was a great lack of experience, which made the task even more difficult. It was already difficult to overcome decades of a certain way of thinking that everybody had gotten used to switching on the face that you had to adopt when you were dealing with communist authorities. And you learn to live sort of a double identity, your own identity, which you could always feel inside yourself and you would use in choosing your friends and choosing the kind of path that you pursued professionally and the, the official face that you had to put on if you were to survive or get a flat that you wanted or a post a job that you had applied for. So there was perhaps a duality that people were used to in the East that made it doubly difficult to become just free media because expression itself had, be, had become tangled. And the source of money in order to run new publications was difficult. And then people wanted different things. I remember in Bulgaria, I had a very dear friend, Radostina Konstantinova, who unfortunately died very early. Um, 
And she was one of a handful of journalists that had taken the freedom they had once Todor Zhivkov was toppled to develop new media. And they became very successful. And then I remember it was a question of what to do with the profits. And needless to say, I mean, this is a slightly sexist remark to make, but it was the men on her team who wanted the money immediately and, you know, to buy the splashy car and to have the kind of accoutrements that added up to I'm doing well under this new system. And the women who were much more keen to reinvest the profits in improved advertising or better technology or whatever. And I just, you know, these were debates that nobody was used to having. And in the West, I mean, there's not an entirely his happy history of Western media working together with media in Eastern Europe. It, just, it was not always very easy to graph these two things together. But not necessarily because there was a, an ideological difference. It was just a difference in approach. And there was no one given way to make sure that media could think and operate differently. Um, thank you very much. Uh, also, uh, returning to, well, going deeper in the, to the free media topic, traditionally we have linked censorship to a state agency. Now social media platforms are increasing their importance as a source of information. And we have seen an active use of that power in order to regulate some political content, especially in the US. Do you think that is also happening in Europe and how should societies respond to this uh, threat? Thank you, taking into account that uh, there is a private character of these platforms. Yeah, I mean, disparate is right. They are disparate and because human beings are disparate. Um, I think that it's important to remember that the United States has the First Amendment and has, uh, traditionally has had a, a concept of saying that it's important to express yourself be able to express yourself in any way. And then we have the big tech companies, obviously, whose reach and wealth is immense and who have set the tone for a certain kind of freedom of expression that now that people are worried about the enormous influence and power of big tech, People are turning to Europe because the European Union has undertaken more actions to curb the curb, to regulate the activities of big tech. I mean, clearly this is one of the great battles of our time and it's not something for which there is a set playbook there are going to be all kinds of things which will play a role and are playing a role um, from court rulings to explanations of what technology can do. Because in a way, I mean, anybody who's seen recent technologi technology, you know that it is possible to fake this setup in this room that we have here. And you could say, well, that wasn't Alison Smail who was talking. It was, you know, some avatar who sounded like Alison Smail because we've, we've got the voice technology down, but actually it wasn't her. And nobody is sure anymore <laughs> what is genuine, if you like, and what is not. And these are things that have developed because man 
and woman quest to find out how can we make things work differently? What can we do differently? What's our possibility? What's our freedom here? We can, you know, we don't have to wait for the government to send people into space anymore. Is that desirable? Is that something we want to spend a lot of money and effort on? Those are the kinds of questions that we should be debating probably much more than we are, because we're also busy also just keeping up with the sheer new developments. So, to try to get back to your question, I think that it's not a matter of censorship per se, it's a, it's a matter of how are we all reacting to a world in which infinite possibilities have been opened up, but they, you know, in all their different thrusting ways, make it actually harder for us to decide as human beings, how do we behave, then it is easy. And it's not censorship that's, that's influencing that. It's our sense of possibility. It's our sense of, you know, if we took a survey of the people listening physically in this room and hopefully out and, and around in the world, we'd probably come up with a different result for each person involved. And yet we're all here because we're interested in free expression. Thank you. And with these improved uh, communication channels, we are also witnessing increasing harassment to journalists by individuals in social media. How could governments and platforms respond in order to balance the freedom of expression by journalism by these individuals? Well, I think, you know, what you need, first of all, is a very clear idea about what journalism can do. And what journalism can do, as I've said, and is a cliche, but it is true nonetheless, for being, for being a cliche, it has an underpinning of truth like most cliches, you know, it is the first rough draft of history. It is the careful, watchful eye on events as they unfold. Um, and if you don't have a good basis, then it's difficult to continue on with a narrative that could be found to be true. So I think that it's extremely important for everybody to bring that to the table. And then we can all decide how do we go on from there? I mean, clearly, there are really loads of interesting things you can do with digital technology. And they can, like every other development on the planet Earth, they can be for the common good or they can be to the detritus of the common good. And it's up to us to decide all the time. Is this something I want to protest about? Is this something I want to get involved with a, a, another group of people um, in order to try and increase the consciousness of the need for climate action on climate, for instance? I mean, I think we've, you know, this has again become a bit of a cliche, but if you look at what Greta Thunberg and her movement have achieved, in t just in terms of global recognition, it's an indication of what you can, in fact, pull off through human activity if you are determined enough. And you ha are driven by a sense of not only do we need to change this, but here is a positive, possible alternative way of doing things. And that's obviously what drives political action and political change. Thank you. Next question. <laughs> um, there are some concerns that when we have these uh, improvements in the communications, we have uh, the phenomenon of fake news and and this type of uh, of not so objective communication. Um, Last November, uh, the Greek Parliament approved uh, an amendment to pro actively prosecute uh, fake news and and disinformation agents. Do you think this is an appropriate response? And doesn't it 
have a, a an opposite effect to the one they they wanted. Well, I mean, obviously, if you're saying a certain kind of expression is outlawed or you're putting curbs on free expression, that's a worry. At the same time, it was clearly cast as an uh, an attempt to to confront those who practice who those who produce fake news or throw the label around very freely. Um, they are casting doubt on the role of the media in, in being able to present an objectively proven version of events. But I think really the problem with fake news is that is the label and that it's being tossed around so casually. I mean, frankly, if it's fake, it can't be news. If it's news, it's not fake. And just tossing around the label fake news is a lazy way of looking at events. It's very easy for me to say, ah, you know, this, that's just fake news that that person is spreading. No, they're spreading more than fake news. They're undermining what has actually happened, which a true account of events. And they're trying to slant political developments in a certain way presenting them as news when they're not news. News is, you know, there's a beautiful tree in the courtyard outside here and it's got some kind of disease and the people in the offices here have decided to unite and treat the disease of the tree. But it's easier along, another group of people come along and say, no, no, that's not necessary at all. It's a beautiful tree. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, uh, time is running out. So we will jump to the Q&A section of this activity. Uh, we, we can, I don't know if it's better if people give their question and we will repeat it so that the people online can listen to it so that we don't pass around the microphone. Uh, so are there any questions for from the audience? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the um, for the talk and also for answering the question so far. The question that I wanted to ask is the question that I wanted to ask was regarding what you were saying about how we all know what freedom is like. We all know if we are able to speak freely, and I'm wondering about how well we can actually feel such a thing in an era of corporate controlled so media outlets, not just in terms of social media and big technology, but also in terms of traditional media with the domination of corporate interests such as the Murdoch Empire, Jeff Bezos owning the Washington Post and so on. If we can speak freely, how much of it is in fact um, rendered through the corporate interests, how much of it is, how much of our news is rendered through corporate power and so forth? Yeah, really easy questions to answer. Thank you. Um, I mean, I think there's always been corporate news. It's just in market economies, corporate interests play a large part because the economy itself has been grounded on market principles and the capitalist instinct has been given at least as much product prominence as a sort of a social democratic, more welfare concerned stance. I don't share the concern of many people who see this as automatically a dangerous thing. I think human beings arrange their affairs more or less as they think they should come out. And so for instance, you know, if you could co compare and contrast in the sort of classic 
examination question how market forces do vis-a-vis -vis a country like China, which is governed under a different principle. I mean, obviously, there are money-making ventures going on in China all the time, and it's a successful economic power. But it's actually under the flag of something different, the Communist Party. Um, as opposed to being a Western, a large Western corporation like Shell, for instance. But in both cases, you have large accumulations of human talent, of wealth, of scientific quest questing for improvement or not. And you have a lot of a plethora of ideas being established. And I think it's increasingly perhaps redundant is too strong a word, but increasingly questionable, do we, can we divide the world into different ideologies, or is it really not now a question of looking at scale and seeing what huge movements of capital and the flow of knowledge achieve? And not being so concerned to label that corporate or non-corporate, but is it effective? Does it make people happy? Does it increase people's welfare? Does it alleviate suffering in the poor regions of the world? Those are the questions that stand behind the activity. And those are the questions which, if you do have access a very broad access to media, anybody can make their point of view known. What they can't necessarily do is attract enough people or money or interest to change the way something is run. And maybe that's a test that we can all apply to ourselves. How much do I really care about issue X if I'm not prepared to go on a march or join a internet petition or you know decide that I'm going to go to swimming even if it's cold <laughs> to sort of do what I want and not put any label on it. I realize this is sounding a little bit anarchic but I think you know that's that's our world. All sorts of things have become possible that weren't possible 10 years ago but we haven't decided where do they fall. And we're probably mostly more concerned about does it, can I actually sort of register this in my cell phone in some way and pass it on to somebody else who I would like to keep informed of these developments? Or am I not even that active? I just press a button and I'm going to still lie here like a couch potato and not really do anything, but I really did do something because I pressed the button and I contacted 1,500 people who think the same way as I do. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for one last question in case someone else wants to ask anything. Thank you for coming today. Um, I guess my question is a little bit more personal, but since many of us are looking to join kind of that communication space and are uh -huh. in this entry level space of our careers, what um, advice would you give to us having gone through such a illustrious career that you wish you maybe knew at the beginning? Well, I think actually the, the good fortune I had was that I didn't know that there was a limit. Um, and there wasn't a limit, as it turned out. I mean, I really was extremely fortunate to go on a very straight line from being a sort of a good student at school, to entry into a good university in the UK, spent a crucial year in Germany as part of those studies, then was fortunate to be able to go to Stanford, and that led me straight into foreign correspondence at a very young age. Um, so I was, my message from that is just keep yourself open to all possibilities. 
clearly active pursuit of spaces where you would feel happy being active is important. And it may be that it's still important to take what I would call a more traditional path into foreign correspondence, which would be to join one of the wire services and see, you know, this is seen as old fashioned and conservative advice. By all means, start another website, do something different and more modern, if you like, but it's very difficult to make your mark. So the question is, you know, what do you pursue in terms of a place where, and what is the mark that you want to make? Is it to be able to say that you work in media? Is it to be able to say that you are, you think you're also aiding freedom of expression in an area of the world that has traditionally not had it? What is your actual aim in taking this action? Or is it just to be able to say, um, you know, I got this great training and other people are jealous of you for having joined Reuters and gotten to report on some fascinating conflict in Africa that most people don't know that much about? Or is it that you want the job that, you know, puts you together with so-called celebrities? I mean, that has never been something that's incredibly interesting to me. The phenomenon of cel celebrity and the role it plays, I find interesting, but the actual doings of the celebrity are not that interesting. Thank you, Ms. Mel, for having this conversation with us today. It was an enriching opportunity to learn from one of the most prominent journalists in the world. <laughs> Thank you for that moniker, which is perhaps not so deserved. What I was interested and in, remain very interested in is hearing what you, as people who are going to shape my future, um, want for the world. And I think that, you know, Definitely the soundest approach is not to have any barriers to your thinking and to express yourselves freely. Don't read the statement, make it. Thank you. Um, we also thank our audience that are physically with us today. And we are now ending the first part of this event. And thank you for our online audience. Um, we invite you to give us a like in our Facebook page, our Power Political Persuasion, in order to keep up our, our coming events. And thank you. Have a good day. Yeah. Thank you, everybody.